quickly for uh, new members here. If you haven't heard this man's name enough or seen him up here <laughs> enough, this is Jonathan Cage. He's our immediate past president uh, of the Warren Astronomical Society. As of a month ago, uh, the first proof work. Diane took over. Tonight, Jonathan's going to be speaking about the mission we got it all. Venus. Uh, because he's a computer guy, he says things like, uh, I enjoy observing with the analog. That's because I'm a disciple of Gary Ross. Okay, well, he says here too, he likes to match vocabularies with Gary Ross. <laughs> and he also enjoys learning with and from the brilliant, wonderful folks of the Warren no, Society. In his day job, he's a software developer for Amazon. Uh, he also loves the other sciences, music, most notably the band Shearwater. His record came out in Chile, January 27th. Okay. Yeah, Outdoors, yoga, people, and other animals, and too much else to include here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I have gotten a bit of a reputation as an addict of the planet Venus. I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think I've presented about the, uh, the final transit of Venus of our lifetimes about six times before it happened. And uh, so, so I was told after the sixth time, right before the transit happened, that I was going to need to find a new line of presentation. So I have. Um, this talk is about missions to Venus, and we're actually seeing the surface of planet Venus here. Um, a little more colorful than you may be used to. It's obviously not the way it actually looks under those clouds. So unfortunately, the talk is not going to feature too many pretty pictures of Venus until later in the talk. So absorb these quickly, and uh, we will get to the spacecraft and eventually work our way back to how we got these photos. So, you don't hear about missions to Venus very often. You hear about missions to Mars all the time. You heard very recently about our spectacularly successful uh, missions to Mercury. Does anybody care to guess how many missions to Venus there have been? I'd say 20. about 20. seven. Twenty. I recuse well, myself. I, bet. I recuse myself. I bet maybe 30. 50. Yeah, 30. Okay, we finally overshot it. There have been oh. 44 attempts really? to oh, get to Venus. 45 if you count the uh, one that happened a couple of years ago in which they shot a surface-to-air missile past the edge of the atmosphere. It took a picture of Venus and then it fell. So that one I don't count, but for some reason JPL counted that in their list. But, but 44 not counting that one. So, yes, um, and in fact, uh, the, for some reason um, JPL left several off this chart, but uh, they show, they, sh they say that there's 41. Um, so, so my number is, for the purposes of this talk, is 44. Um, um, right now, there's one highlighted, there's one current mission happening in Venus, the Akatsuki or Dawn craft that uh, Japan sent, and that is the only thing going on there. Um, part of the reason you haven't heard more is that so many of them were unsuccessful. So, so these are the successful ones, there are 27, but the problem with that number is that it counts uh, flybys on which the craft were on their way to other places. This includes Cassini, this includes Galileo, this includes uh, the you. early Mariner mission to Mercury. So if we actually count the missions that went straight to Venus, we do get down to uh, a count of only 22. Well, then I was right. So <laughs> you were right in terms of actual <laughs> successful missions, but it's not for want of trying. So, now we are going to explore my theory for why you don't think about us doing so many missions to Venus. If we take this picture of successful missions and break it down by the country that sent them, it becomes very obvious. <laughs> Five NASA missions, one European Space Agency mission, two JAXA missions, both of which both of which went up on the same speed, uh, rocket, and 15 Russian missions. So, for some reason, we don't want to talk about Russian successes in space. Um, 
but that's mostly what I'm going to be talking about because they got to most of the fun stuff first. So the first attempts were largely unsuccessful. Russia tried first with Tvatsili Sputnik, which, was, which just means heavy lift Sputnik, heavy lift satellite, and uh, they, it failed and then they spun the mission to be about something else. Basically, they said, well, we put a rocket up and we put this heavy lift vehicle into space, and that's all we were trying to do. No, they were trying to get to Venus, but that didn't come out until after Gorbachev. So uh, then they admitted that they were going to Venus with Venera 1. Of course, the US caught up the next year with Venera 1, which also uh, had to be detonated in orbit. Um, actually, I, I skipped something. Um, Venera 1 actually did fly by Venus. The problem is the craft died as soon as it got away from Earth, so it didn't, it didn't send back any information, but it did actually fly by Venus, so it was the first spacecraft ever to fly by another planet. So that's pretty cool. Um, 2MV1, which doesn't have a fun name, was another Russian craft. It was so they have had two missions already. The third mission, they are already sending a lander to land on the surface of Venus. So they were certainly aiming high. So unfortunately for them, the first successful visit was made by Mariner 2 in 1962. It actually survived all the way to Venus and sent back data. It didn't take any pictures, but it recorded the temperature of the atmosphere of Venus for the first time. So this was when we confirmed that the temperature of the atmosphere was 500 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. <clears throat> so that was pretty much the bright spot for many years. We had a whole bunch of Soviet craft, one after the other. Uh, so they had, a, they had one flyby happen. Zon 1 and Venera 2 both flew by the planet as well. They also did not send any data. Venera 3 did succeed in dropping a lander to the planet, but as soon as it got into the atmosphere, it died. So for the first successful entry, we give the prize to the Soviets for Venera 4. It did the first chemical analysis of another planet's atmosphere, discovered that Venus's atmosphere was composed almost entirely of carbon dioxide, which was a matter of great debate in science, including in the West, until 1967. So, so back, um, you know, people were still debating in scientific papers two years after this what Venus's atmosphere was composed of, probably because I don't think the Soviets were really sharing their data. Um, it took temperature and pressure readings, and it proved by crash landing and falling over, um, basically they they had built in a whole bunch of safeguards to prevent water from getting inside the electronics. And the tests that they had to show whether or not they encountered any water showed that the atmosphere was so dry that there couldn't possibly be. And uh, so from that point on, it made life easier for them because they could drop all the water proofing. So they could put in a lot more scientific stuff. And that got them some more successes. They dropped. Uh, atmospheric probes. These ones weren't meant to actually make it to the surface, but they took data on their way down. And uh, they did basically just further chemical analysis was the main thing that they were after. But they also dropped uh, a medallion carrying the state coat of arms of the USSR and a base ready for Vladimir Lenin. Um, within another year of that, they achieved the first mostly successful landing. And if we can think of the European Space Agency's lander on another comet as being a success, so is Venera 7. <laughs> this is often minimized in Western sources because we don't like giving them their due. But uh, it actually landed on the planet, sent back surface temperature readings, and uh, even the Soviets thought that it was a failure, but they found out about two weeks after that they had actually continued receiving signals, but they were much fainter than expected. So that's how they knew it fell over, and it wasn't pointed in the right direction. So the first totally successful landing was really the next year. 
Um, so, uh, Venera, land, Venera 8 landed um, about 500 kilometers from the morning terminator. 500 kilograms of spacecraft, and it lived there for 50 minutes sending data and basically confirmed all of the earlier chemical analyses, confirmed all of the earlier um, temperature readings and pressure readings, 470 degrees Celsius, 90 atmospheres. And it also proved that Venus's clouds only exist at a, as a high layer. And as soon as you drop below them, the amount of light available on the planet and the clarity of the atmosphere of the planet is very similar to Earth. Um, on a cloudy day. Would it so, have been this mission to, to discover the sulfur dioxide? Um, so it, what it did discover was that the, so I don't think it discovered the <coughs> sulfur dioxide, um, but what it did discover was that the surface, it actually did some surface rock analysis and uh, discovered that the, basically the, the crust of Venus is very similar to granite based on the uranium, thorium, and potassium ratio. So finally, the US got around to sending another probe there. And with Mariner 10, we got the first close-up photos of the planet. Um, although it was on its way to Mercury. But this was still by far the best shots that we had ever gotten of Venus. And finally, the Russians really made their great breakthrough with Venera 9. 1975. So you can see over time they've added on more and more parts to their landers and made the antenna. So that curly Q thing on the top is the antenna to transmit. So they boosted the power um, and made it much sturdier. Um, it's, the metal sphere is actually titanium because that was the only way to make something last in Venus's climate. And finally they succeeded in sending back surface photos. So these photos were pretty much lost to uh, history until an amateur, a professional scientist who became an amateur Venusian scientist named Don P. Mitchell made friends with half of the retired Soviet uh, Venus scientists and figured out how to take their raw data and turn them back into pictures. So he, he spent years writing C++ code going through dumps of data from the Soviets and uh, put these photos together. <coughs> so Venera 9 mostly, so this is, it's kind of a fisheye lens, but so the top photo is, is the first, kind of the first pass, and then he reprocessed them until he got a perfect view on the bottom. So it's all the same view. But. Then Venera 10 landed and took some very interesting photos that kind of look like we think of Mars as looking. And uh, so both of them are very similar designs. They have very similar photographic equipment. So it's a lot better than you might expect for the time, for 1975. But it's also not really HD. Um, so meanwhile, the US, as it was its way, like for every five missions Russia sent, we sent one. And so we sent the Pioneer Venus mission. So we had a, a radar mission, which was Pioneer Venus 1, which produced the first complete map of Venus. And then we sent the uh, Pioneer Venus 2 lander, which was a partial success. Only one of the four probes actually made it to the surface, and it didn't last nearly as long as the Soviets, and didn't really provide too much that we didn't know. And finally, uh, right after I was born, the Soviets sent Venera 13 and produced the first color photos. Um, also the first high resolution photos. So these photos were also re reconstructed by Don P. Mitchell. Um, so, so this is both the same lander on each, one on each side. So there's, uh, it does not look like a very fun place to be. You know, you can easily imagine yourself on Mars. The, the topography just seems more Earth-like. This really is kind of a hellish view. Um, it's like 
the Bonneville salt flats, but, but <laughs> even worse. So, but we did get some color. Um, so they had basically they had color filters. It's the same way that spacecraft today work. Nobody actually sends color cameras into space. They just use filter slides to go over the black and white, so they know which which pieces are which colors. And as you might expect, it's pretty yellow on Venus. Venera, Venera 14 followed the same year and took similar photographs. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to reconstruct the pretty large view that he did for Venera 13. And then finally, we had the first high res mapping of the planet with Venera 15 and 16 doing laser surveys in 1983. So, um, unfortunately, <coughs> only did part of the planet, but the resolution that they got was much higher than Pioneer Venus had. And finally, um, then there's something happened in the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, the next thing, and basically the Soviet space program ended, and uh, we were the next party to get there with Magellan. And Magellan was the first real huge success of American missions to Venus. We took a complete detailed map of Venus. Pretty much any map that you've ever seen on the surface of Venus up until about five years ago came from Magellan. So Magellan took the level of detail that allows you to, basically it was a radar mission, so it gave us topography. And so we can do things like produce projections of what the mountains on the Venus look like. And we can even produce a three-dimensional globe. So that is where I'm going to leave off on this talk. But uh, there's a lot of really fascinating history that I didn't even touch. So maybe in the future we'll have it. But thank you. And there's Uh, the, uh, the ESA mission did even more mapping, uh, even more detailed mapping. Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. I was mostly thinking about the Soviets. Was there <laughs> anything else from them that they found besides the mapping? Um, no, I... Venus Express? Venus, Venus Express. Express, that's it. Um, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, unfortunately, we just... So Venus Express was really interested in figuring out how Venus became the hellish wasteland that it is. Um, and I have not researched in detail what they learned. Um, basically, they wanted to know how a planet that was very similar to Earth turned into this. So, um, and that sounds like a good subject for a follow-up presentation. Yes, Joe? Jonathan, you said uh, Magellan 1 had to be detonated in the, in the atmosphere? Uh, just outside the atmosphere. Just about, why? What? Uh, it just went off, of course, and they were afraid that it was going to re enter the Earth. So, oh, okay. just that, that was pretty much the story. Of, you know, if you go back to this, many of these were actually detonated. Um, many of those gaps were detonated intentionally because something went wrong. Yeah, some of them. Some of them just stopped transmitting data, but a lot of them blew. <laughs> the early history of the space program, both of them were yes. fraught with disaster. Oh, yeah. Were there any other questions? Parker. Uh, what about manned missions to Venus? <laughs> so manned missions to Venus. Um, so well, yeah. you know, there has been talk of, of actually doing a high atmosphere like balloons. Um, I don't know. It seems like it would require a lot more funding to get that worked out. It's a one-way trip, in other words. <laughs> um, I, I think it would be, you know, I think it would be really cool. I don't know if they, that they would see anything interesting from the tops of Venus and clouds, though. Yes, sir. What are the? Uh, I saw something online where they were talking about if you actually had something, you could actually float in the atmosphere because yes. the atmosphere is so thick, and yep. you may not even need full cover that you could just have a, uh, a mass that the atmosphere would not burn you that you could actually breathe through it so that it might actually be more hospitable than even Mars 
in the atmosphere. So there's not oxygen though, so so breathing, I don't think breathing would work. I think you can there's not CO2 available oxygen. oxygen. You yeah, you would need to you would need to break down the CO2. Um, but yeah, um, the definitely the upper atmosphere is not as inhospitable as you might think, but it's also not something that we are rushing to explore anytime soon. Um, I believe there is one mission to Venus scheduled by NASA uh, sometime in the next decade. Um, any other questions? Did you, did this you say that they found no water in the atmosphere? No water. That's amazing. Yeah. Because I think it's too hot. I mean, the, the pressure, the temperature and pressure just, uh, you know, Let's see, the carbon captures it, though, I think, under those yeah, conditions. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, well, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed it.